a new poll has again highlighted the growing unpopularity of the Tories amongst voters, with the latest figures uh, suggesting that Reform UK is ahead of the Conservatives among male voters, not least in red wall seats. Well, joining me now is the Deputy Leader of that party, Reform UK, Ben Habib. Thanks for uh, being in the studio, as is the pollster and co-founder of Delta Poll, Joe Twyman. Candice Holdsworth is with us as well. Let me ask Candice first, actually, before I chat to uh, the others. I mean, this is clearly very, very worrying for the Conservative Party. They are into the teens in these figures. I find it so interesting. I mean, I've sort of been very circumspect about the whole thing because I remember with UKIP years ago, you know, when you had all these Conservative MPs defecting to them and everyone was like, oh, the Conservatives are over. And then it kind of fizzled out. But maybe what we're seeing now is if you're seeing a collapse an actual collapse in the Conservative vote in certain constituencies, then maybe that could mean that reform could actually do something in our first-past-the-post system. Well, let's very ask difficult. Them. Let's ask them. Ben, uh, Reform UK has... Uh, you have one MP, of course, Lee Anderson, but you've always, uh, in the last few years that you've been in existence, struggled in some, uh, in some elections anyway to get uh, success in that first-past-the-post system. But you must be delighted with these figures. I am utterly delighted, and... They're right, the figures are right, and the people are beginning to see the Conservative Party for what it is, which is not Conservative. And Candice makes an interesting point. You know, in 2015, when um, uh, UKIP got four million votes across the country but didn't get a single seat, it looked like first past the post was going to be a problem for an insurgent party. But I think a, two or three things have changed since then. The first is that people have recognised that the Conservative Party actually isn't small c Conservative. Big tick in the box there. Second thing is, the economy and the way people feel about themselves, the state of the country, the public services, our cultural setup, and everything else is all in the spotlight at the moment. After 14 years of Conservative government, people know that the country is broken. Uh Whereas in 2015, the Conservatives were relatively popular. And so the 4 million votes UKIP got was in spite of the Although fact that... Although if you actually look at yeah. some of the statistics in this, Ben, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I, I take nothing away from the fact that reform is doing well. That is a fact. But at the same time, if you look at uh, the relative stages within the electoral cycle, we'll go into this with Joe Twyman in a second. In 2014, UKIP, a uh, predecessor to your party, although UKIP still exists, uh, won the European election with 26.6% vote share. In 2019, uh, the Brexit party, um, of which Reform UK emerged, uh, came with 30.5%. So perhaps being on 16, 17% actually isn't where you want to be at this stage in the electoral cycle. Well, I, I, well... Obviously, just, you wanted to be higher anyway, yeah, but what I'm higher. saying is, shouldn't it be higher? Well, in October... But let's just go back. You know, we're three years old, the party. We were polling at 1% three years ago. In October 2023, we were polling at 5%. Earlier this year, we were polling at 10% when I got my 13% vote count in the Wellingborough by-election. We're now polling at 15%. The Tories are down to 18 or 19. We're, in a smi we're within a smidgen of overtaking the Conservative Party. This is a very febrile political environment, completely different to any environment I've known in my life. I take the point you make about the European elections in 2014 and 2019, but people didn't take the European elections as seriously as they take the general election mm. or, or, or any... Any by But in the last in vote for a parliamentary seat, Rochdale, I mean, you did really badly there. Yeah, Rochdale was a really weird by-election. You know, you didn't have a Labour candidate because he was cancelled at the beginning. The whole Gaza-Israeli thing seemed to loom bigger than any domestic issues. And um, there was a lot of hate and vitriol and... Uh, it was, it was definitely a, a very strange set of circumstances. Strange, yeah. Joe Twyman from Delta Pool, uh, tell us what you think of these statistics. How widespread is this and how many MPs on this do you think that Reform UK could actually have after the next election or is it none? Uh, well, uh, there's no doubt that Reform UK have been a success story in the polls over the, uh, over the last few, uh, few months. Certainly since October, that's uh, definitely true. They've improved their position. And it won't help come the general election because I don't think you'll win any seats. And... That is not to do with, uh, with the performance compared to the Conservatives. That's to do with the performance compared to Labour. Because you talk about uh, performance in the red wall seats doing better in the, uh, uh, among some constituencies uh, against the Conservatives. And that, that may indeed be true at this stage in the cycle. But you have to contend with the fact that, firstly, we would expect some Reform UK voters, probably around about a third, to go back to the Conservatives come the election. But more pressing is the fact that Labour in the Red Wall are considerably ahead. Of well, the only, the only counter I'd make to that is these polls don't measure those people who 
declare themselves not to be voting at the moment. And I think as people recognise who reform are, what we stand for, the fact we really do uh, believe in small-c conservatism, low-tax uh, deregulation, smaller government, proud of the United Kingdom, strong borders, but strong defence. does that happen that undecided voters go along those lines? I, I think no, they, no, they, they're not coming out for the Tories, yes, let me tell you that. No, and that is, I would agree that yeah. that may be true, but the idea that they're going to switch to reform is simply not backed up by the data at the moment or indeed by historical precedent. And I think particularly the difficult the difficulty that reform will have come an election is that you have to find 600, perhaps 630 candidates and a depth, a, a squad depth, to use the, uh, to use the football metaphor, uh, is extremely difficult to establish in such a yeah. short period of time. I think time. if you don't mind me saying so, you're hijacked by your view of precedence because what I'm saying is that the political environment now is more febrile than I've ever known it in my lifetime. More, more febrile than during the, uh, during the referendum for Brexit? Well, that was a referendum. It wasn't a general election. No, no, but you, but you, said, the poli you said the political situation. Yeah. And I'm saying it was as and febrile we then. And we voted for Brexit. Against all the precedents, against all the establishment nonsense, rhetoric and everything else, all the scare stories, the people came out and they said they wanted Brexit. And we are back in a position where the people want the United Kingdom to be put first and foremost, and they recognise the only party that will do it is Reform UK. Labour hasn't got a policy. All that Labour says is they won't do anything particularly nasty, otherwise they'll stick with the Tory agenda. And the Tories are completely out of ideas and they're imploding. Okay. We haven't seen this before in the UK. Tell us how significant it is that men are backing reform. Certainly, we see that 19%, especially in some red wall seats, uh, according to this polling. Uh, do those demographic groups really matter, Joe, or not really? Because, of course, everybody's vote is worth as much as yeah, anybody's, I mean, no matter what their sex. They, they definitely matter. And it's no surprise, really, based on the kind of historical situation that we've seen, whether it's support for UKIP, whether it's support for the Brexit Party, or whether it's support for reform. It tends to be higher among men. Men are more likely to support such groups. Uh, working class men are more likely to support such groups. People in some red wall constituencies are more likely to support such groups. And indeed, people who voted, uh, people who voted leave are more likely to support such groups. But that doesn't mean that there are enough of those people in such areas to bring about the kind of numbers that would be needed to overtake Labour. We will which see. Is what you, well, <laughs> yes, of course we will. And we have seen in the past. You're hijacked by precedent. Well, uh, Don't let history always be the judge of the future. We have to adjust is the way we think. Is it possible that you're presenting a positive view from a strategic no, perspective? No, not at all. Look at where we were in the polls in October 2023, 5%. We're now at 15 We've trebled our position in six months. Well, so, in and the another, so, in another six, so in another six months, you'll treble it again? I, I, well, I'm not saying we're going to treble it again, but we are on the march. The political wind is in our sails and the Tory ship is floundering. It's hit the rocks. It's sinking. We haven't had but this situation But it's not the before. Tories you need to beat in the red wall. We need it's to get... Labour no. you need to beat. What we need to do is get the small C Conservative vote out. I want to That's talk about. We need. I want to talk about hijacking because we yeah. heard another story today, of course, that, that China has been hijacking our electoral data. We know that 40 million people's information has been uh, has been uh, accessed by China. We were not given the full story. Now we have the full story. There's uh, going to be a statement by the deputy prime minister later today. How worried are you by the threat from China, Ben Habib? Well, I, uh, the whole global position is extremely difficult at the moment. You know, we have um, a resurgent Russia in Ukraine. We had Russia pinned down, or Ukraine had Russia pinned down in the southeastern region. They were going to break through and repel Russia. That didn't happen. Russia is now spending eight times as much on military hardware than it did three years ago. The West seems to be half asleep at the wheel. NATO isn't spending, the NATO members aren't spending anywhere near as much as they should, with the exception of the US, on armaments. China is naturally being pushed into a corner with Russia. That's the alliance that's forming, China, Russia, and India to a greater or lesser extent. And then we've obviously got all the proxy wars that are taking place in the Middle East, you know, which is Saudi versus, in my view, the whole Gaza-Israel thing is really a, a Saudi versus Iranian um, geopolitical battle. And um, so we've got instability everywhere. And one of the things, without wishing to go back to party politics, that reform is very strong on is 
defence spending. And we've been completely... But part of that as well is not just about hardware, military hardware. It's about misinformation, disinformation, and so on. And we've seen some of that apparently coming from China and Russia, or even over the weekend on uh, the Princess of Wales, uh, Joe Twyman. And I wonder, in terms of disinformation and misinformation, is there polling to show how much that influences people in their, in their voting and so on? I mean, uh, do we know how influential these foreign actors can be? Well, it's the kind of thing that's extraordinarily difficult to uh, difficult to of course, test in a, sur yeah. in a survey instrument. Uh, well, that's kind of the point, isn't it? Yeah, uh, uh, and there is an important distinction between disinformation, which is deliberately incorrect information that is put out, and misinformation, which is information that is wrong but people believe to be true that is uh, that is circulated. So they're sort of doing it in good faith, essentially. Exactly, yeah. and and one indeed, an action by one actor in disinformation can lead to misinformation yes. from others. So. So it's a very complicated uh, complicated picture, but I'm sure that in the UK general election, whenever it may be this year, but also crucially in the US election mm. in November this year, we will see an enormous amount of uh, attempted activity by, uh, by those both within the country and outside the country. Uh, the question is how much impact any of it will make, and we just don't know at the moment. Candice, what do you want to hear from Oliver Dowden later today? I think we're really going to have to start thinking about this now. I think the warfare of the future is going to look very much like active disinformation, then downstream from have that been misinformation. Ignoring it, do you think? Have, have, the, have the attempts to deal with this just not been strong enough? Well, I think yes. I mean, I think the social media companies, in particular Facebook, really struggled to get to grips with it at first. And it's something that, you know, very liberal, libertarian minded people do struggle with, you know, bad actors. And then, you know, we started seeing in, in 2016, we started seeing the influence of bad actors in, the, in, in our elections. So I think it is something we do have to take very, very seriously. And going forward, we're going to have to really think about how we deal with attacks on our digital in infrastructure, deception, fakery. Um, are individuals, individual people, going to have to start becoming a lot more literate? And we're only just waking. Events. We're only just waking up to these risks. You remember, three years ago, Boris Johnson wanted to put Huawei through our 5G network. You know, the UK, as ever, has been incredibly slow to wake up to these risks. Donald Trump was calling out China years before anyone else was, and you know the the sort of established liberal intellectual elite all roll their eyes at Trump, thinking he was just a warmonger. But he was absolutely right about China. And we should have been taking preventative steps years ago, as we should have done with Russia and our dependence on, its, on, you, on Russian fuel. Do you worry just briefly, Ben, about the proximity of the American election to ours? There's been thoughts from Five Eyes, the security alliance around this, that we should actually split them apart because of misinformation and disinformation in two of the leading Western nations, G7 countries. Yeah, I mean, they will interfere. But I think Joe makes a very good point. Whatever these people do, I, actually, they can't go into the, into the ballot boxes and place votes. Mm. And uh, I, I don't feel that, no, notwithstanding their interference in the past, that actually they've had any material impact one way or the other. Well, on we'll voting intention. We'll, we'll continue to debate that. Thank you very much indeed to Ben Habib of Reform UK, Joe Twyman of Delta Polling.